right, so I'm Billy Romero, the Video Operations Manager at Fubo TV. Oh, thank you. Yes. And I'm Thomas Zimborski. I'm a software engineer on our research and innovation team. And we're here today to share with you our experience streaming the 2018 FIFA World Cup live uh, in UHD uh, with HDR10. This was the first time, one of the first times we'd ever done our own end-to-end -end, uh, live video workflow completely in the cloud. Yeah, so some of the things that we're going to cover, uh, the uh, acquisition, the network setup, encoding and packaging, uh, the uh, origin and CDN configuration, as well as how we were able to monitor the video. There were a lot of firsts for us in this. We had never released any content encoded uh, with HEVC in production. We'd never dealt with HDR in any of our workflows. Uh, uh, and uh, this was, like I said, one of the first times we'd ever got done the source acquisition all the way to play out. So here's the actual tech specs that we got from Fox. We had uh, literally 36 days to get this up and running. Uh, you'll notice that these are obviously 4K HDR10. Uh, they provided two 70 meg transport streams, uh, HEVC, uh, 60 frames per second. They offered two different types of audio, 5.1 and stereo. Uh, and then they worked with CenturyLink on the actual handoff. So uh, they were going to do uh, the AWS Direct Connect platform, uh, and then delivery was going to be uh, RTP with FEC. So what we did is we actually took the, uh, you know, all these requirements and sent them over to a, a few different vendors to see if they could you know, handle you know, all of this on their input. And uh, while we were waiting on feedback from them, we started uh, working with CenturyLink on getting the actual uh, network connectivity in place. So this is just a, kind of a high-level overview of the uh, network setup uh, to do the uh, CenturyLink Cloud Connect uh, uh, platform. You, uh, you have to set up a dedicated VPC. Uh, inside of that, obviously, we have to do subnetting and firewall rules. We have to set up uh, EC2 instances, uh, virtual private gateway, internet gateway. And so once you kind of had all of those things in place, uh, CenturyLink uh, uh, provided their edge router uh, in Las Vegas at a colo that was connected to the AWS network. Uh, what they do is they set up a virtual private interface uh, in a Direct Connect console, and that ties to our virtual private gateway. And once they set up uh, the actual invite, once we set up the uh, connectivity there, you know, there's a bunch of stuff that kind of happens under the hood and basically just helps get the uh, BGP uh, session going. Uh, this was actually our first time ever doing something like this, and surprisingly, it was fairly straightforward. CenturyLink was great to work with, and it was uh, uh, surprisingly simple to get going. So uh, we started hearing back after we got the connectivity in place. We started hearing back from the vendors, and uh, one of the big things that was an issue was the actual 70 meg input. It was just one vendor that said, yeah, hey, we can't do that in AWS. They just didn't support it at the time. Another vendor, they were actually able to do everything. They were actually able to do all of the requirements that we provided except for that RTP with VEC input. And unfortunately, that was just the only way that we were able to get the delivery. Uh, and then we found another vendor that was actually able to do everything, including uh, the CMAP package output, which was really something we didn't know we were going to need until uh, you know, we started digging in. Uh, and that was actually uh, Tim's Titan Live product. Uh, so once we, uh, you know, we, we finalized the encoding vendor, uh, we installed their software on two EC2 instances. Uh, these were some of the largest compute instances that you can do in AWS. These are the C518s, uh, 72 CPU, 144 gig memory, uh, 25 uh, gigabit network throughput, which is probably a little bit more than we needed, but Happy to take it. Um, so we got that installed, and once we got the you know, network uh, connectivity in place, uh, we started getting some test feeds from CenturyLink, and it allowed us to start uh, uh, playing around with the different profiles and how we want to kind of you know, set everything up. Uh, so you'll notice uh, we, you know, we, we chose four uh, output profiles. So these are four ABR profiles. Uh, the top one, obviously, was the UHD. Uh, you'll notice this is 16. We chose 16 megabits per second. Uh, you know, all four of them had HDR10 on the output. One thing you'll notice, we didn't have SDR. We weren't able to, we just didn't have enough time to figure out how to do the HDR to SDR conversion. Uh, we, it was, this whole HDR thing was totally brand new to us, and we just didn't know, you know, uh, how to do any of the research for any of the toe mapping or anything like that. So just didn't have enough time to, to work through that piece. Uh, top two profiles were 60 frames per second, uh, and then obviously we went with the uh, 2.0 stereo with uh, AAC uh, codec, obviously. And uh, so the actual packager was the same, same software. You know, the, the, the Titan Live was the encoder and the packager. Uh, 
This is uh, our first time doing CMAF. So, you know, for those of you who probably know, if you're doing HLS and HEVC, you have to do fragmented MP4. It was, again, something that was new to us. We typically do uh, transport streams. Uh, and then, so that's, we started playing with the uh, segment size, the fragment sizes. And the, uh, we, we focused more on that top profile, that uh, 60 megabit UHD profile. And we, we did everything from two seconds up to 10 seconds. And it felt like for us, you know, for kind of smooth playback, uh, five second fragments uh, were, you know, kind of what we settled on. Uh, and then we pushed those to an origin server. Uh, we did S3, uh, not really perform it, but it was something that was quick and easy to set up in the limited time that we had. Uh, and then we fronted that by our Fastly CDN, which uh, Thomas is getting ready to cover the configuration. Cool, yeah, and building on what Billy said, we used S3 as our live origin. It wasn't our first choice, and I wouldn't recommend uh, using S3 as live origin. It's, a, of course, block storage with an eventually consistent model. Um, uh, the only reason we, we used this was actually uh, the packager, the encoder packager combo that we had selected didn't have compatibility with some of the off-the-shelf uh, off uh, 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 origin options, things like media store, uh, and we didn't have time to build like a hot origin ourselves. Uh, so we went with S3. Uh, some things that we saw here, of course, uh, some, some issues with stale manifests uh, from time to time. We saw 404s for segments. The encoder packager combo we selected uh, in its dash output didn't include the UTC timing element, of course. Uh, that means clients with overeager clocks start requesting segments that don't exist yet, uh, while the packager is trying to write those segments to the same key location. Not the best. Um, but uh, we fronted S3 with Fastly. Uh, Fastly is uh, our kind of our, was our prim primary CDN for a while. Uh, um, and we are very familiar with the configurations there, and so we took some of that learning, some of the learnings we had with our mainstreams, brought those over to, to this service. Uh, we decided, we definitely put the origin shielding, which is of course that request collapsing feature on, uh, on this service to, to reason about uh, requests back to origin. Uh, for security, we had you know, Akamai style IP locked edge tokens that were uh, validated there on the edge. Uh, we were required to have uh, some, some semblance of geo restriction here as well. Uh, Fastly, of course, gave us the visibility and logging at request level uh, and things like congestion, window size tweaks, and whatnot. And so this is just kind of very, very high level, obviously, the end-to-end -end workflow. Uh, like I said, we, we only had like 36 days to kind of try and put this together. This was CenturyLink uh, acquiring the feed from Fox, putting it onto their backbone, distributing it up to uh, a colo um, in Las Vegas that was connected to AWS's network, which is where we did the, um, the, the direct connect with our VPG installed two EC2 instances, uh, basically one for each uh, input or one for each feed, uh, sending it out to S3, which is, which is obviously funded by Fastly. Um, this, I thought, was actually surprisingly fairly simple to get set up. Uh, you know, we've done some, well, I've done some on-prem stuff before, and this was definitely something that was literally a matter of days to get going. So, you know, it was uh, surprisingly and, and, you know, great to do and uh, a great learning experience for sure. Cool, yeah, we were made aware of the opportunity to put this content on our platform uh, not very long before these games started. Uh, and so there was, of course, the initial work to see if there was even a, a, a path for us to do this in the cloud. And once we felt confident there was a solution there, we turned our, uh, our eyes to the players and the clients, and uh, we had some decisions here. We uh, could focus on one platform and try to optimize this experience for a single platform, uh, or uh, as our, 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 our offering, Fubo TV is on a lot of different connected devices. We could choose to, to try to bring it to every device and just pull the learnings, uh, try to get as much information as we could about the way uh, this content uh, uh, performed on these devices, uh, and we decided to go with that latter approach, uh, being very, very careful to be public and, and honest about uh, this is very much a beta feature. We don't have the confidence that this is going to be a rock solid, awesome performing uh, stream. Um, and so, yeah, uh, when we, when uh, 10 days, I think, before the first World Cup match, uh, we, uh, uh, we, we, we were looking for a device uh, in, our, in, our, in our office to test the stream on, you know, once we actually got the encoder and the delivery 
delivery side set up. Uh, we had some test uh, inputs, and we were looking um, you know, for a TV. We didn't actually have one in the office that supported 4K uh, and HDR. Uh, so um, uh, we, we were looking around, and someone had purchased, by mistake, a, a TV that had you know, 4K <laughs> HDR support. It was on its way out because it was too expensive. Someone bought the wrong thing. Um, so we quickly you know, got that out of the hands of the UPS guy trying to, trying to take it out and uh, opened up that box. Uh, it actually didn't have a stand, so we propped it up against the wall and started hooking devices into it. Um, and some of the things that you know just came out right right out of the bat, some things that we, that surprised us, maybe shouldn't have surprised us, but this was the, this was the first time we had been dealing with this content, uh, so this is great to learn. Uh, Billy already mentioned it. If you want to do uh, HEVC uh, with HLS on the Apple players, you have to uh, send that over in the fragmented MP4 containers. Uh, so we had to go back. We were we initially started with an HLS TS stream, that didn't work right away. Very easy to go back and change that. Um, uh, we use HLS primarily for most of our live streams, and so, of course, we tried first the HLS stream on all these platforms. We were very surprised without any tweaks uh, how poorly the HLS uh, stream performed, and of course, we could have looked at the, uh, you know, the manifest, and maybe we were doing something incorrect there. We could have looked at the uh, client implementation request profile and tried to figure out why uh, players had trouble keeping up uh, with the HLS stream. Uh, but we also had the, this nice dash output uh, right, right alongside, and we decided to just throw the dash stream into these, uh, these boxes and found that you know, ExoPlayer on, on Android, um, Roku's own player, and of course, Shaka, uh, available in the common application framework on Chromecast uh, worked much better without any extra configuration with our Dash uh, streams. Um, and rather than you know, spend the time to dig in and try to figure out why that was, which is something we definitely wanted to do, but we were in the ramp up for the World Cup during this time uh, with, our, with our main content, uh, let alone this experiment we were, we were running. So we decided to just choose uh, the stream type um, per platform. So we would send the Dash streams to our Roku platforms, and we'd send our HLS uh, streams to our Apple players. And then, if anybody here has ever messed with HDR content before, of course, if you put, put this on a SDR screen, the colors look super washed out, and uh, it, it's a horrible experience, and even though it's being sent in 4K, you really don't get the benefit of that rich color, and, um, and we had to think about what that experience was going to be like for users. Uh, this was new to us. This is, a, this is kind of a, a surprise, and then we had the opportunity to, to, to stay, take a step back and say, you know, we spent a lot of time investing in trying to figure out if this is something that we want to do. Uh, if we know that only a few users are ever going to be able to experience this content, is this actually worth continuing? Is this work worth putting more investment into? Maybe our time is better spent uh, working on uh, our kind of a normal setup, our normal uh, live streams, our HD live streams that we're going to make available for the World Cup. But we all got in a room and decided on a strategy. We were going to update all of our players to advertise their support uh, for two main, main things for this stream, uh, HAVC decoding and a screen with HDR10 uh, capable uh, uh, support. And um, uh, what, what we ended up doing as well is kind of doing, making system calls on every platform to try to figure out what decoding support was available on that device, pass that back up to our API in, in a special header, and then our APIs could make decisions about what streams to send users. Uh, maybe we would hide the, the, the stream for users who were on a setup that couldn't handle the stream. Uh, these were things that, we, that were made available to us. Uh, here you'll see the system calls that we made to try to determine the support specifically for this stream. Uh, I was actually surprised how straightforward this was, um, just kind of putting them here just in case they're useful for anybody else. So any user who didn't have uh, a setup that supported both HAVC decoding and a screen with HDR support would end up seeing this instead of the stream when they clicked on it. Um, and of course, this is not a great experience, but it's a lot better than just a kind of a muted, uh, weird looking uh, display without any explanation as to why this was. This gives the user you know, some hints and then links them out to a page that would, uh, would kind of tell them what they would have to do uh, to modify their setup for this content. And then working through platform-specific things that came up, just along the lines of lessons learned, mobile adoption was really kind of blew us away. We did not expect this. Uh, so we had, uh, at, the, at the time, of course, we were checking for those two things, HEVC decoding support and HDR uh, display. Uh, the iPhone 10 and some of the newer Samsung devices and some other Android phones, of course, have those combinations. And so uh, those users could watch the stream. Uh, it was important for us to kind of take uh, into account the viewport uh, into, into the adaptation logic to make sure we weren't pumping a 4K stream to an iPhone 10, uh, where you know, we're wasting battery uh, decoding, we were wasting bits in that transfer. 
Uh, Roku's own Premier devices, things like the Roku Premier uh, Plus and the Ultra, uh, uh, performed really well with our dash streams, but the TVs that had the Roku OS loaded on them, uh, we experienced issues on stream startup or, 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 or the, the, the TV kind of keeping up. And we've been working with Roku to solve this problem. They've been able to address it for some of the TVs that they, uh, they bundle with, and then we're continuing to work with them with our, uh, our subsequent live uh, 4K streams to kind of figure out and work through these issues. We also observed an interesting issue on Apple players, uh, where some clients would not ad adapt up to uh, the 2K, uh, 4K variants. Um, mainly, we were using the 5.1 uh, HEVC um, uh, main, 5.1 profile for the HEVC codec. And uh, we, were, we weren't sure, and the authoring spec seems uh, not, not super, super explicit about this and whether or not uh, the Apple devices support this codec, although when playing the variant directly you know, outside of the master, uh, all, the, all these uh, devices were able to play the stream just fine. This is something, if anybody has uh, any, a clue as to what, what this is, come and talk to us. We'd be very interested to hear, uh, hear what you <laughs> might have to, you know, some knowledge you might uh, drop on us. So also, user education was super important. This is a non-standard workflow for users. People didn't know that, hey, if they had set uh, color mode on their TV to a manual setting versus automatic, that they would have to go back and change that in order for this to work correctly. Um, so it was a uh, two-way communication as we talked to our customer support re representatives to both get feedback back from users uh, as to uh, the experience and issues users were having, and then uh, recommending some, some steps for, 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 for resolving those and sharing those with our teams uh, that were talking to the users directly. So yeah, this is actually uh, what the feed looked like. We started getting the live feed in from, from Fox uh, a few days before the opening ceremony. Uh, as you can see, it's, it's a little blurry. It's got some, some noisy lines in it. And uh, we were kind of like, you know, I'll be honest, we were like freaking out. We were like, did we have, did we have the wrong encoder config? What, you know, what's going on with it? Um, you know, and thankfully, you know, we work with Fox. And you know, it ended up being a source issue. And they were able to you know, obviously address it before the opening ceremony. But uh, it brings us into like, you know, how we wanted to monitor the actual video streams. So uh, to do that, uh, in, in our normal you know, workflow, we have Tektronix's ABR Sentry. And for those of you who don't know, it's kind of like a, it's like a probe that acts like a client that's going you know, to call the manifest, and it's going to call the fragments inside of that manifest, and it's going to analyze it for things like you know, macro blocking, uh, black screen, uh, still screen detection, uh, audio loudness, you know, even reports back on stale manifests. And thankfully, uh, they had a version that supported HEVC and Fragments to before. So uh, we, we put that into our Sentry, and uh, we set up some, uh, some alerting on it. And we were able to, to work with Fox uh, with uh, their operations center. They provided us a 24-7 Slack channel. So anytime we got an alert, it was nice because we were able to actually just go in and validate you know, directly with the source, like, hey, is this an issue? And there was a couple times where it definitely was, and they, you know, they recommended you know, falling over to the backup stream. So it was definitely very, very useful to have. Uh, a couple other things that we found very useful was social media. Um, we, you know, some of it was good, some of it was bad. But uh, it was definitely a great way to kind of get uh, you know, the feedback directly from the customer, and you can kind of see what their experience was like. Like Thomas mentioned, there was even you know, one issue, like the, the one with the blue screen here, where uh, the customer was getting capped at the 1080p profile, uh, and they, you know, it just would not shift up for them. And you know, it was something that we were able to take back and, and validate. But not all bad. Definitely had some good stuff as well. Yeah, and this is the stuff that we definitely you know, lived for. This was the thing that made it all worth it, apart from enjoying the content ourselves uh, in, the, in the quality and the, in, in the nice uh, wide color modes. Uh, users really enjoyed this. We, we were able to bring this to users in a way they weren't, uh, they weren't familiar or hadn't been able to, to see this in the, uh, before. Uh, and this was really kind of, uh, it, 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 uh, uh, it, was an, it was an amazing kind of positive affirmation for all the work that we put into this. Um, so some stats. Uh, uh, on the left, you'll see uh, kind of just the distribution of the clients that got to use this during the World Cup. Uh, once again, you know, with the HDR and uh, UHD kind of constraints. Uh, mobile ad adoption, over 50%. Those blue, large blue and, and yellow uh, pieces are Android and iOS. 
Um, and the ones that actually got to under, experience like the full, uh, the full experience were, uh, of course, the ones in the minority there. On the right, you'll see uh, just an indicator of volume. This is pulled from our CDN uh, request uh, uh, stats. Um, you'll see the quarterfinals. We had multiple games during the day. We had two in the morning, two in the evening. Uh, and that's why you see two spikes there. It kind of crescendoed at the France-Belgium game uh, towards the end of the, uh, of the World Cup. And then uh, kind of the traffic was about steady all the way up into the final. And that, that wasn't the end of 4K for us at Fubo. We've had the opportunity to, uh, to bring some more content uh, in 4K, although all the follow-on content we've done uh, since then has not been in HDR. Uh, we do have some, some, uh, some, some chances, I think, coming up to do some more HDR work. But uh, subsequently, we had some MLB games, some college football games, and most recently, uh, an EPL game on NBC Sportsnet. Um, and uh, you can see here on the right the same kind of volume indicator. Uh, the, the EPL game was a really, really, really big game for us. We were super excited. Uh, this was uh, announced, I think, in the press, and people came in directly for this content in this resolution. And we were, we were very happy for the opportunity for a you know, wide uh, array of customers coming in and experiencing this and all the learnings we could pull out of that. Uh, you see the distribution has definitely changed. Uh, Mobile is no longer the majority. Uh, you see web now taking up a good uh, bit of the traffic, and that's, of course, uh, folks on like the latest uh, Safari, um, uh, our li latest MacBooks with Safari, kind of able to play our stream. Um, yeah, and so uh, I guess we... Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. So a, a couple of things here. Um, you know, we didn't know... Uh, how the World Cup was going to go and kind of what we were going to do after, you know, after the whole you know, event was over. And uh, it actually opened up so many more possibilities for us than that we didn't realize. So you know, like Thomas mentioned, uh, we've done, obviously, uh, baseball and uh, college football games in 4K, like he mentioned, the EPL game that we just did. Uh, but it's opened up so many doors in terms of you know, we're doing acquisition differently now as well. Before we did uh, AWS's Direct Connect, we've done it with Zixie now, we've done it with SRT. Um, we've done 4K events uh, in AWS's cloud as well as doing it in Google Cloud. So just something that you know, has been great and you know, a great learning experience. Um, we're hoping to do, uh, you know, like Thomas mentioned, uh, hopefully a HLG event coming up in a couple weeks. Um, so it just, it's just been great, you know, to, you know, it just opened up so many doors for us. So yeah, in conclusion, very high level takeaways from, from, uh, from this experience. Uh, we had a couple opportunities to drop this uh, 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 experiment entirely, and we're very glad we didn't. Uh, we've gotten a little bit of a preview uh, into what this is going to be like uh, when more and more of this content is made available to us. Um, you know, fail, fail fast, uh, get those users who are uh, willing to give you feedback and willing to tolerate uh, um, uh, the kind of the learning curve as we, as we kind of bring the system up to par. Uh, don't take anything for granted if you have the opportunity to take some of this kind, this kind of content in, look, really inspect your entire workflow, encoding, delivery, uh, play out, and make sure that all of your systems are ready for this content and you're handling these edge cases, and really focus on the user experience. We still have a good ways to go to make this super, super seamless for users where they can think of the content as a single piece of content available in all these different resolutions, uh, and we could, we're looking forward to finding uh, more and more ways to make this super, super seamless for our users. But that's about it. Um, uh, thank you for coming out. If uh, you have any questions or want to drop us a line, our emails are here. Um, thanks very much for having us out this afternoon. Thank you.